So I get a call and it's Marguerite. Hey, boss, I found your stuff that got stolen. What do you mean you found it? Where did you find it? Uh, it doesn't matter. But people who took it, they just, they didn't know who you were. Well, I explained to them who you are in the community <laughs> and you will not be robbed again. Hey there, if you've joined the podcast today, my name is Chris Jarvis. I work with companies on employee giving and volunteering programs. And my name is Jake McIsaac. I spend a lot of time thinking about public safety and restorative justice. So we are having conversations here that we've been having for 20 years. Yeah, the only difference now is we press record and share it with you. Thanks for joining us. On today's episode, we explore the connection between a thousand hours of community service, a break and enter, a drug deal gone bad, and an environmental catastrophe. Yeah, that's right. We're going to talk about my friend, Marguerite. It's a good one. Let's get into it. All right. A couple of weeks back, Jake, you and I were talking about how your dad volunteered you <laughs> to go help your uncle. Classic Rick. Yeah. A classic Rick. Mm -hmm. And um, during that conversation, we talked a little bit about some folks that we knew and we talked about this idea of meeting people at their highest level of contribution. And we said we'd come back to that. So I thought we could talk a little bit about it. And I've been running a bunch of stories. You teased actually. a story at yeah. the very oh, end of that. I episode. did. Okay. Which one? It was about uh, a break and enter at the church. Do you remember that one? Oh, right. Right, 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 right. I think for everybody listening, I need to set up the story a little okay. bit. Uh, obviously, you know this, so I'm not telling you anything. No, but I, I like to hear... You describe it. The, the setup uh, should be good. And I, I'll chime in where, where needed. I forget what year it was. It was uh, 2002? Yeah, thereabouts. Something like that. And, and anyways, um, I was working at this little church. Jake and I were both involved in, I guess, church work back then. It was in the winter. And it was in the first, it was, it was after Christmas, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was cold. It, this is Halifax, Nova Scotia. So it gets, what What are the temperatures range? I, I haven't lived in Halifax for a while. I'm in Baltimore now, so. Well, it was significantly below freezing for this story. <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> right, for days on end, right? Like in yes. the winter, it gets it gets cold. In fact, uh, when I was growing up, you used to be able to go just skate on any of the hundreds of lakes in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. They just all would freeze over. It used to take city plows onto the lakes, uh, a couple of them, and plow them off for the kids and that kind of thing. So it gets cold. Right, you have to keep your heat on. You have to keep your heat on, because uh, if you don't, the pipes will freeze. Mm -hmm. Obviously, and so uh, everybody's running their furnace. This isn't new for anybody who's lived in cold weather. Nova mm -hmm. Scotia, like other areas in the world, still uses oil, heavily dependent. Sure. Yeah. So we have these big oil tanks outside or inside, and the trucks pull up, and all winter long, these companies dump flammable liquid in these tanks and fill them up. And this was happening at this little church building that was out in an area in Spryfield, and they would just come up, fill it up. So I show up, and you were you'd been a part of some mm -hmm. of the things we were doing in this little congregation. But at this point, you were doing something. I was different. off on my own. Yeah, off on your own, doing your own thing at another church in the neighborhood. Right. And when I get there, it's freezing. It's absolutely freezing. <laughs> I'm like, what? What? The furnace is broken. What's going on? Because we knew that the oil was on a regular schedule. My dad actually was one who's very, very careful about these yes. kind of details. He would be. He would obsess about it. So when nothing else could be figured out, we went out and we looked at the oil tank and it was like empty. Like the mm -hmm. little thing said empty. So I gave Esso a call and we said, hey, where's the oil? And they said, what are you talking about? Full tank yesterday. Full tank. There's no full tank. Check again. Check. Click it. Click it. Click it. Then somebody said, what's that underneath? <laughs> <laughs> so what had happened was the tank that the company had sold us used one little piece. Now, I'm going to say something here that is going to sound stereotyped and a whole bunch of things. But anyway, oh, you know what? I'm going to say it in a way. That we all lean in. All right. Okay. There was this one little screw, one mm -hmm. tiny little fastener mm -hmm. that was made for a lot less in a country far, far away. Mm -hmm. And this company used it and it should have been fine. I'm sure there were lots of other parts there, but anyways, it cracked. And that one tiny crack let the nozzle go on the bottom and all of the oil just went right into the ground. Environmental catastrophe. 
Yeah, yeah, an environmental catastrophe. So, so we call, I don't even know, the equivalent of the EPA or whatever, and they came out, and ESO came out, or Irving, I think it was, and they're looking around, they're like, yeah. We <laughs> Let's just throw it. everyone under the bus. Yeah. You're, <laughs> you know, you've moved, you've moved away from Halifax, so sure. Yeah. Throw as many stones the as you like. They're going to be calling. We want that show canceled. No, yeah. it wasn't their fault. Like it's just that it was just an accident. But they they said, okay, so you're going to have to dig up all the ground and wash the dirt. And we're like, we're going to have to do what? <laughs> and so we called our insurance company. And they said, oh yeah, too bad for that. And then we looked a little closer. No, oh, no, there's a clause. There's a clause <laughs> for this that hardly ever gets used, right? So then we went into this regiment and the story is a lot longer than it needs to be, but they, you know, shut the building down, brought in all the trucks, started digging up all the dirt, trucking it away where it would be washed to get rid of the petroleum. But the problem was uh, when it hit the bedrock, the bedrock had been cracked when they built the foundation. So all the oil just went way down into mm -hmm. yeah they it, it was an extensive process that was going to take months so that's the setup it, it took almost a year to remedy that situation right but you still have to keep going as a key little so, community yeah so we told the insurance company look we if we can't meet here uh, maybe we could go to a small school and but we would need to get new sound equipment and we would need to pay rent and they're like yeah yeah how much you need just go away stop talking to us and the amounts we're thinking we're like i don't know it could be six thousand yeah yeah go get it send us the receipt we'll have we'll pay it but to them they didn't care they're just like i just need this to be over right? they're in so, the hundreds of thousands now yeah but we're you're trying to be conservative you're trying right. to yeah not be intrusive sorry right. to bother you yeah exactly <laughs> so Mar uh, maritimer we went out we bought a couple speakers mic stands yada yada everything that was built into the building and they were generous. The insurance company is generous. And we found this little school and we're meeting at the school. And you may have actually heard us tell some stories about a gentleman named Cadney who was mm -hmm. uh, back on the episode Scott with, with Scott. Yeah. 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 And they, they actually were getting to know each other and becoming friends. There's so many weird stories going on at this time. But this particular one meant that after it was cleaned, we brought back the equipment to the building. So this is the fall, late fall of the same year, probably 2002, right? I think. Thereabouts, yeah. You got a call one day. It's been a break in. So I went over and they had broken in one of the doors. There's nothing else to steal there. It's all used clothing, food we give away that somebody else gave to what like there's nothing worth stealing at this building except for a brand new sound system. <laughs> brand new sound system. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, you just look up to heaven and you think, really? <laughs> this too? Oh man. So um <laughs> called them up and they said, What? What happened? Well, you've broken in. Okay, we're going to enhance your security system, and we're going to buy you new equipment. So I said, okay. And remember, they're they're kind of going fast. These are small amounts to them. They just want it done, right? Well, now we have to back up a little bit. We have okay. to introduce our main character. Marguerite. Marguerite. When did you first meet her? Well, I've known Marguerite's family most of my life so my family and marguerite's family were intertwined shut up but i didn't, I didn't know, know. That. yeah yeah my uncle was involved with marguerite's mom way back when i was a kid i think Are they you hung serious? around yeah but that was a long time ago and there's to be fair i think there's like 12 kids 13 no she had 21 she had 21. 21 yeah 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 there yeah. were double digits so I'm yes. like, yeah there's still over 12 alive today yeah uh, anyway I, I knew of marguerite but i didn't know marguerite until about the late 90s when probably around the same time around when we met because we yeah. you and i would have met in 96 yeah 97 and then met her shortly thereafter and yeah. and i've mentioned this before so one of the things we were doing uh, was the Sunday Suppers. It's still meeting. Um, what's the name of the church? It's on Coburg. St. Andrew's Church. St. Andrew's Church. It's still meeting yeah. there. Still there, yeah. What I loved is that there was no sort of criterion for for showing up. Like there's no right. checklist. There's where no you, check you have no, to sign in. And you could. You deserve this to is be the here. one. This is the one meal, so you can't go anywhere else. Like this one was rife and wide open for people to abuse, and it seemed to be okay. Like. Yeah. Everybody show up, yeah, yeah. and it doesn't matter if you went to another place an hour ago and had yeah. supper. Didn't come matter. here and have a second one. It yes. didn't matter, and I love that. Yeah. That was my favorite part about the Sunday suppers, and continues to be. 
one of the things with Sunday suppers that I appreciated was there was kind of space for everybody to be met at the highest level of contribution. And so we would do a brief just before the meal. And in the brief, we would present what we call the Disorienting Dilemma, which was meant to get people to a place of curiosity and openness by helping them sort of framing an experience where maybe their experience was not going to line up with their expectations. And we began right. that right in the in the brief. Like you're here to serve a meal, but we're not here to fix the poor. They're not a problem to be solved. And then we would talk about the different jobs. But if you if you want to contribute at your highest level of contribution, you'll sit down and wait for a meal and just talk to people. I know you're here to volunteer and you're here to help, and I hope a whole bunch of people do. But if you could find the courage <laughs> yeah. to just yeah. go out and sit down and, and talk and eat, I promise you there's no greater contribution than yourself and just your presence as a person and the dignity that that brings to other people. That's way beyond a meal. I think uh, courage is exactly the right word because um, uh, folks were not afraid of anything other than being rejected. How do I know what where to sit? How do I know, will they accept me at the table? If I ask to sit down, these volunteers who'd come in, where you, you send them out and say, okay, go to your highest level of contribution, grab a plate of food, sit with the guests, sit yeah. down. And you could see that people who wanted to do it, uh, it wasn't that they were afraid of physical harm, but this right. rejection moment. What? How do I pick the table? What if yeah. I go in uh, if I and then what if I say something wrong? Or how do I even broach that may i sit here i see right. there's an empty seat right so it was yeah. like prison rules. it was it could I be scary it. it's intimidating yeah yeah but but after they did it for the first time oh the next week when they came back it was much yeah. easier yeah yeah and even if it took two or three weeks over a couple month period people would become they would begin to see the event much less about a place where I'm going to help those people with their problems and a place where I go because, and that, that because yeah. might be open-ended. Like I, I may not be able to answer it, but there is something I'm getting out of there, but I may not be able to say what that is, but you're moving to this sort of place of reciprocity and a resilient approach to things. Like we just talked about the other day, a with posture. Yeah. I, I would often sit in the, the, in the back right corner uh, I've sit with Robert, not every week, but often. Yeah. Um, and I would use that space uh, to invite people who were struggling. So more of a guide posture in that. Yeah. yeah where if yeah, someone's yeah, walking yeah. around and I think that they want to find this place to sit, right. I would often keep a seat open next to me to invite a volunteer to come and yeah. sit. So when Marguerite walked in, that's mm -hmm. kind of the dynamic, right? Yeah. You have 170 people, you have a bunch of volunteers. Some of them are trying to figure it out. Some of them are figuring it out, but can't articulate it too well. And then we've got a small handful like yourself who are watching people, making sure they feel connected. They have something else to do. So Marguerite comes in and she is none of these things. Mm -hmm. She is a unique actor at this point because she's not coming as a guest, even though if you were to look at her, you'd say, oh, guest. Right. 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 Yeah. And she's not coming as a volunteer because. Because <laughs> they weren't volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> because they're volunteer hours. Okay. So let me describe her. She's about five, six, and she's like 40s. Uh, she's had all her teeth pulled. I get, I've referenced this before. Healthcare in Canada, while it's free, dentistry is not. You can't get your teeth cared for until it's like beyond repair and then it becomes a health issue. And then they just yeah. pull it and give you dentures, which get lost or not used. And uh, she didn't like her dentures. <laughs> so she didn't wear them. Uh, so uh, she walks up to me afterwards and I think she's just, you know, stage one showing up, wanting a place to, to volunteer, or she's a guest uh, and she could be an, to eating some of the food too, and just wants to help with it too. And we were very open to that. In fact, some, you know, early on, somebody suggested, should we have t-shirts for the, for the volunteers just to give them a sense of identity. And rightly so, one of the women running it said, no, there's a, she didn't say power differential, but that's what she meant. She said, mm -hmm. you know, she was saying that artifact says you're not us. Right. And so we didn't, we never did that. So it was always kind of hard to figure out where people are coming from. So she plops down. She says, you're in charge. I said, well, for all intents and purposes for this conversation, <laughs> sure. And she said, I need to do a thousand hours. I said, a thousand hours of what? And she said, community hours. Now, again, for those who have never received community hours, Jacob, you, you deal a lot yeah. with community hours in your career. Yeah. A thousand would be a significant number of hours. You know, you're a high number is generally... <laughs> 
250 hours. <laughs> that, you know, uh, and as a person who has had to find placements for people doing community service hours and paying their debt back to society in that way. Uh, right. I wish I could air quote all of that. Um, but <laughs> we're air quotes. Uh, yeah. But, but, yeah. but, but there's, um, that's a ton. Of that's hours, a big number. A thousand yeah. hours. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're looking for a parallel analogy, most six of us, months of full time work. Right. Yeah. And if I said, well, you got a mortgage. Oh, it's a 15 year mortgage or a 30 year mortgage or five year with the balloon. This person would say, I have a hundred year mortgage. <laughs> what? <laughs> kind of. That's, I didn't even know that was possible. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. So she's got a thousand hours. She says, you'll be my boss. I need to come here every week and you need to sign this paper. Now I'm disoriented myself at this point because I've never heard of a thousand. So I'm thinking, uh, I don't know if that's possible. What did you do to get a thousand hours? Uh, and anyway, something else happened. I signed it and we're off to the races, right? Afterwards, I remember distinctly, you know, I had this green van that I've just had bought. You remember this thing? <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Like a uh, whole thing with that. And one of the ways I justified it in my mind was I could use it to give people a ride to and from sunny suburbs, right? It's like when you find a truck to haul stuff and then you keep finding jobs to do that you would never have to do normally in order to justify the truck. So I'm, I'm bringing people out there, lining up, and we're going to drive eight people home. And she wanders out from ba the back of the lineup and walks right up and gets in the front seat. And I'm going to go around to get in the driver's seat as other people are piling in, but they stop. All of them stop, look at her, and then look at me. And one person says, is she coming? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Do you know who she is? I said, I, I can't remember her name. Mary? Mar That's Marguerite. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you can't drive her home. Why? She's dangerous. What do you mean? She cut a woman's finger off. <laughs> woman's finger off? What do you mean? Yeah, she owed her money and she cut the fingers off. What? Now, I, I, I just can't. There's no way, right? Like, you're telling me she's Robert De Niro, Al Pacino. <laughs> that's, that's what you're suggesting here? I, I'm sorry. I said, look, I'm driving. You can get in the van or not. That was the quietest drive. The only person talking was Marguerite. And I couldn't quite understand. I hadn't gotten used to her cadence yet. So I couldn't quite understand everything. But I kept looking in the mirror. Everybody else is just sitting there looking at me in the mirror as if <laughs> I'm driving them to their death or something. And they resent me for it. Yeah, I can I can see that. That's hilarious. So drop everybody off, drop Marguerite off. Years later. No, you know what? No, let's just leave that right now because I didn't know that story at this point. So let's fast forward a couple of years. We're now where I'm standing at that building. We bought new equipment. It's an evening, and I get a call on my cell phone. Can I, can, I, can I pause one second and just jump in and say the hours are going well. In fact, by this time, I think the hours are done. And the most interesting thing about Marguerite is she stays around. Oh, my gosh. That, that is such an important part of the story. As people finish up their community service hours, you're not quite sure if they're going to stay or they're going to take off. Right. And there's this awkward, can I keep coming? Yeah. Yes. Right? Not all the time, but often people would, you know, get into a bit of a rhythm and get to that second stage where they're right. like, I I'm coming. I may not be able to articulate why, but it be it's important for some reason. I have right. to keep coming to this. Right. And you're right. Not everybody, but a lot of folks. And so Marguerite, she's putting in her thousand hours and she's finding other ways. She's like, you're my boss. I, I became her boss somehow. Mm -hmm. That was my new title. Uh, she never called me Chris. It was like, hey, boss, what are we doing now? And <laughs> all through the week. She, now I'm picking her up and bringing her out to the building or because we're fixing stuff because of the oil spill. And over the years, she's becoming more and more active. So the hours have been finished by 2002. She's a regular facet in all of this. Everybody is like, oh, that's Marguerite. And we continue to become impressed with what she could get done. Right. I, yeah. I remember thinking yeah. it's like very, very you, resourceful. I remember one of the organizers of the Sunday Suppers calling me up once and saying, you know, we have a problem with Marguerite. Why? Because she's she's stealing hmm. turkeys. What do you mean? Well, the churches all get together and they give out turkeys. And we found out that she's calling several times. And she called two or three times and she got two or three turkeys. 
Oh, well, I'll talk to her about it because I, I know her. So I don't like she, what is she selling them back to stores at a dollar a pound or something like I, that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. So I, I, I asked her about it. Oh, I think you were there, too. We discovered a couple things. Yeah. Uh, just how resourceful uh, yeah. uh, she was to sort of navigate and figure that out. But also how uh, compassionate she was to take on something for the, her, her entire community. Yeah. Because she wasn't two or three turkeys. It was like 23 turkeys. Yeah. And she was giving them all away. She was the turkey plug. Everybody was getting hooked up. Everybody yeah. in the block. Don't worry about that, dear. I know a place. So yeah, in an interesting way in the, in, in the community, in, instead of having everyone come to sign up for their turkey. At, at a church that they could find on a list that you had to, I, I don't even know how big, it's all they did. They, they, they may not have had relationship. Maybe right. They would have been intimidated to go. Maybe they just right. would never know. She just sort of solved for all of that. Yeah. She became the distribution center. There is no supply chain issues. She, <laughs> solved, she solved them all. You tell me what you need and you will have your turkey and I'll take That's, care of you. And I was, and continue to be, blown away by how yeah. how simple and relational that approach to uh, community care was. She just figured it out. Yep. And then, of course, the system folks had a problem because they lost, tra they lost the track of turkeys. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. That's not the way. We, we're not going to have one person. There's no trust order that person? here. There's right, no order. Right. But this simple idea of meeting people at the highest level of contribution meant that as you lived in relationship with people and saw right. them step up or learn something new about them. Yeah. You could adjust things. You could ratchet up and go, oh, that's the level they're contributing at. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to treat them despite all the stereotyping and despite everything. Like if you look at her, no teeth, no education, no job career to speak of, health issue after health issue after health. She's just a long list of deficits. Yeah. But if you know Marguerite, she's the power broker. She's the connector. She's the ligament in a part of that community that could do things that nobody else could. That in the end outperformed police in Nova Scotia. And, I'll, yeah. and so that brings us back to our story. So I get a call. Jake, I, you and I have talked about this so many times. <laughs> so if I, if I miss a detail, you jumped in. Yeah. Right? Okay. So I get a call and it's Marguerite. Hey, boss, I found your stuff. I'm like, <laughs> what stuff? Your stuff. The stuff that got stolen. What do you mean you found it? I'm thinking that's a pawn shop. The side of the road? I don't, I, I hmm. often I experience disorientation in the first part of a conversation with Mark. Yeah. Because I'm like trying to catch up with, I don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, I found <laughs> your stuff. Uh, do you want it back? What stuff, Marguerite? The, the, uh, the two speakers, the microphones, the stands, the keyboard, and a few other things. Where did you find it? Uh, uh, it doesn't matter. But, <laughs> Just no but they took it. And then she said this line, they didn't know who you were. I said, what? Uh, the people who took it, they just, they didn't know who you were. I told them who you were. It won't happen again. What do you, what do you mean it won't happen again? Well, I explained to them who you mm. are in the <laughs> community and you will not be robbed again. And when she said you will not be robbed again, she said it with sort of an authority that I have very rarely <laughs> experienced. It's sort of like, like yeah. you can take it to the bank. This is yeah. going to be this way because she was connected to a community that was kind of in charge of the non-system community, the parts of society that refuse to operate within the good law and order of those of us who are in power, right? And so within that community, there's there's hierarchy, there's do's and don'ts, there's guidelines, there's there's all of that. We all organize as human beings, right? right. Some of yeah. us are in the official system and some of us out of it. And you and I began to realize the level that she operates in the alternate or the shadow system in Nova Scotia. Yeah. And, and, and how, um, leadership shows up in very, very different ways. Right. So that not just the power structures, but the structures of influence. Yeah. So you're right. Um, police through their tactics could tell you to, uh, or insurance companies buy a better alarm, maybe yep. get some cameras. Police yep. will do extra patrols. Yeah. But only one person could come in with that level of <sighs> assurance and yeah. say, uh, this won't happen again. So a community-based approach to public safety that was deeply about uh, connections and relationships. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do we build 
uh, stronger communities. As an example, this is one. This is one that only got to that level where she could so confidently dispatch your concerns around being robbed again. Not that I think you were concerned because the insurance company was probably going to come through a third time. <laughs> so <laughs> probably didn't understand that uh, <laughs> she was really protecting the insurer from well, another claim. To, to that point, I called the insurance company up and I said, uh, we just yeah. bought this stuff, but a, one of our congregants can get the, he said, I don't want to hear it. Just keep it. Yeah. I don't want to get involved anymore. Okay, yeah. fine. But it is interesting how without those early steps of being at the Sunday suppers, saying yes to a thousand hours, that conversation could never have happened. That conversation yeah. was planted two years before. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 what made it possible was not the completion or transaction of those hours being completed, no. but actually how the pathway to uh, being part of that community and part of the family and part of that whole and you kind of have to have a place for people, right? I think that's the point you're making. In in your community, you have to have a place for people don't fit what you may have anticipated. So uh, I have my own Marguerite story that I remembered that was similar to <laughs> similar to yours. About three years ago, I get a phone call from Marguerite, 2019, 2020, something like that, just before the pandemic. And um, <laughs> she says, yeah, it's Marguerite. I said, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I could tell. <laughs> so uh, Chris said, I was talking to Chris. Was he talking to you? No, no. This is when oh. I like to say I was Jarvis. Uh, said uh, <laughs> That's a verb. I mm -hmm. was Jarvis. Yep. I was Jarvis. Uh, Chris said, uh, you know, he, he's not here anymore in, in, in town. I said, no, that's right. My sister died. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So Chris said you would do the funeral. <laughs> so no, I, I said, didn't. no, I, I know <laughs> because... <laughs> There's not always a lot of, um, it's very direct <sighs> communication. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, I tried to be nice and say, well, okay, so a lot has changed in my world and in my life. And I actually don't do that anymore. I'm not a pastor. Oh, yeah, sure you are. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, uh, I haven't been, I haven't been doing funerals or anything like that for a long time maybe i could find someone no i talked to chris you're, you're gonna do it <laughs> I did. okay all right and i in this oh, moment man. i knew on the phone i was not going to survive arguing yeah, there's this no out. Way out of it yeah so i just said yeah okay okay now i i, I knew her sister and and, and yeah. the family yeah and so i i start to go down this path of Oh my gosh, I was so nervous. I'd been out of, you know, it's they say, you know, you do things long enough, it's like riding a bike. Not true. No, yeah. No, I was terrified. That's, that's and like let me be clear. Man. Let yeah. me be clear. This is not the room to mess up. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, it's, so, it's, it's like doing a funeral at the Apollo. Like you're going yes. to be that is better heckled? than what I was gonna say. Yes. There's heckled no or like this sucks. There's no margin. <laughs> You no. cannot screw up. You, you, so the pressure. So I'm 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 already nervous. I get there. There's a couple hundred people in the chapel. Yeah. And you know I'm I'm on time. I'm out back. I'm kind of reading over my notes, thinking about what I'm going to say. Whole family's there, and the funeral director shows up and says, uh, "Excuse me, uh, Pastor." I'm like, "Actually, it's Jake." But it, you know, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter <laughs> at this keep point. Going, yeah. <laughs> he says. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, if you could hold the service for about 20 minutes. And I was like, hold the service. Uh, yeah, um, one of the uh, one of the family members got a pass from the federal institution, uh, is being transported here for the funeral. But uh, the bus is late, and they should be here in about 20 minutes. If you now it's hold. a federal penitentiary, just yeah. in case everyone's yep. wondering. Yeah, and if you could just orange wait, jumpsuit the whole thing. So I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So I go out to the leader of the family. I go find Marguerite and I say, listen, this is a bit of a weird request. Uh -huh. I got this. What would you like me to do? How, how do you want me to do it? We're not waiting. Now, that's really important to know because Marguerite knows one mm -hmm. of the few reasons you can get out of federal penitentiary yep. is to attend you can come to a, a bereavement issue, right? Like yeah. a Like a funeral. And so this is important for this guy. Like, this is his day out of jail. This yeah. Apparently, there's some hiccup. Uh, they're going to be about 20 minutes late. We can hold it. I can make an announcement. 
you know, maybe people can go and have a smoke. Like we could just, <laughs> we'll just push it back. She said, nope. I'm like, oh what do you mean? No. Gosh. No. He's late. He's late. If he misses it, he misses it. Now, I was like, well, now I'm going to have to do this twice. <laughs> so, so I go back to the funeral director and say, I mm. have to do this. The family's directed me. Off I go. I'm nervous. It's going okay. But halfway through, the door opens in with two correctional officers is this gentleman in the back. And I'm like, and he looks incensed. Yeah. That this has started without him. Yeah. And we're at least halfway through. Yeah. He's he's missed the readings. He's missed the yeah. obituary. He's missed all the eulogy. And I'm getting like the death stare from the back. At the very end, we get through it. And uh folks are, you know, I go back, I start greeting people at the door as they're leaving. And and uh, he says, um, what I miss? Because I go over, I talk to him and talk to the yeah. guards. And yeah, yeah. what I miss. I was like, ah, you missed the first part. Um, can you do it again? Oh. So, I literally, as soon as it left, ran the first thirty minutes no. back, just just for the four of us, myself, him, and the two guards. Jake, I don't think I've ever heard that part of the story. You did it again, and Marguerite left with her group. They left, and they they went to. There was a bit of a a repass or a mm -hmm. thing after, and I said, mm -hmm. "Look, I'm just going to do the first part." He wanted to go through the readings. He wanted to have the whole. So I just picked it oh up and gosh. reboot for the first 30 minutes. But you don't say no to Marguerite is basically where I was going. Is basically, story. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. And so when whoever she called uh, that had taken the materials from the building and she told them whatever yeah. who he is, that set the tone. That and person it was like, did not say no either. That person didn't say no either. And I know right. who she was talking to. I know I know an idea of who she was talking mm -hmm. to. People who don't listen to too many other people for anything ever. They're serious people. She didn't call the people who did the B&E. She called the people who are in charge of right. B&Es, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But I, yeah. I think that that was the... She had a very unique set of skills and a, yeah. you know, uh, that she was willing to contribute wherever it was yes. possible. And so if if her uh, ability is to have conversations where people don't say no, that's how stuff gets returned, that's how turkeys get given out, that's how yep. funerals get done. Yeah. Uh but she she's doing it out of care and concern for other people. She is. She fundamentally is, but you wouldn't know that if you didn't take time to get to know her. That's right. You, didn't you would always assume uh bully, you yep. would assume uh brash. Yep. And actually in each one of these stories, need, she's actually making it better for others. That's exactly right. So the one thing I would never, ever describe Marguerite as needy. No. Not once. I would describe myself as needy. I'm mm -hmm. very needy in a bunch of different ways. <laughs> you definitely are, Jake. We, we could have a whole episode on your neediness. <laughs> in fact, I'll write it. <laughs> no. That might be a solo one. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not, not going to clog. You could just do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Item number 64. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So I want to wrap up one thing that we left the listeners with, which was she cut off this woman's fingers because of a cocaine issue. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, Marguerite had gone to jail for using cocaine. And then the government recompensed her for some abuses that happened to her in prison. It wasn't out of my thinking that something could be there. So um, two years ago. I'm with my mom, interesting connection with my mom and dad, two very conservative individuals, yet they got very involved to a degree, very involved to a degree in the Sunday suppers. And Marguerite became kind of part of my family now out there with my mom she, and my sister. She, she loved your dad yeah, so much. She really did. She really respected him. And, and, they, mm -hmm. and he was so business and yeah. get to it. It totally fit her approach. And weirdly, one of yeah, the families that adopted... <laughs> It did fit, right? It like yeah, they got yeah. along. And she never took offense to my dad. Lots of people would. The way he mm -hmm. was kind of gruff sometimes or came across that way. He wasn't like that. He was very generous and helpful too. But weirdly, they both were similar. And the irony was, in my mind, she was in the foster care system. One of the families that took her in, she took their name and the last name was Jarvis. It was in the black community. Right, and she was right. raised by the black community. And Jarvis is a popular name in certain parts of the black community, different parts of the world. So her last name often came up as Jarvis. So Daryl Jarvis and Margaret Jarvis and nothing alike, but so similar mm -hmm. in so many ways. So 
couple of years later, I'm down there. We're dropping off turkey, ironically, for Christmas to her and taking her some potatoes and things she called my mom she needed to give to friends, but also to use. So knock on the door. Hey, oh, I haven't seen you for a long time. It was great. It's same kind of house, public mm-hmm. housing. It's in the pubs where you actually yeah. lived for a while. Yeah. Very smoke filled. Everything that you would imagine if you've had any experience with um, a broader set of communities than maybe just the middle class white one that you yeah. grew up in. And I said, Marguerite, before I leave, I, I have a question that's been bugging me for over 10 years now. She said, what? And I said, <laughs> did you cut off a woman's finger? What? Did you cut off some woman's finger about owing, she owed you money for cocaine? What? No, no. I cut <laughs> off all her fingers. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, I cut off all her fingers. What do you mean? And she didn't owe me money for cocaine. She wanted some. And she was coming at me to take it and she had a knife and I pushed her away and I picked up the knife. And when she went to hit me in the face, it was in my hand and I just blocked her swinging at me and I cut off four of her fingers. I said, oh my gosh, what happened? She said, well, um, I called the ambulance and they came and took her in and sewed on her fingers. Are you serious? Yeah. Okay. So where is she now? Oh, she's a friend of mine. Yeah, she came and apologized a year later and said I shouldn't have done that. It was my fault. And for, <laughs> did you ever apologize for cutting off her fingers? She said, "No, no, that was an accident." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just like uh, all right, and she just moves on. And this this friend apologized to her. So she is a very uh, influential person in this space. And there's one other story where she actually saved mm-hmm. me and my family's life. Mm-hmm. We'll tell you that story some other time, but. Out of all of this, Jake, the thing that stands out, and I think one of the reasons we wanted to talk about it in relation to the previous episode about your dad uh, being met at highest level of contribution, which was send my son to help right. out. But then when yeah. you were there, you figured some things out with your uncle and you kind of stepped up to that role too. Are you still going out there? Are you still, what, whatever happened, you were going to organize something with Yeah, no, I, I've, uh, I've, I've continued to go back and having different conversations about uh, what sort of long-term plans could look like either yeah. and, and, and debating whether that is in a community where he's cared for. Because one of the things that we've recognized and he's recognizing is um, even if you attend to all the needs, uh, the one need that's not being met is social need. And so right the need to connect with other people right so even if people are dropping by it still feels very transactional this is the person who comes by for the food this person that comes by and drops oxygen this person so we're having a conversation we had one this week about just relationships and how nice it is to connect with people just to talk yeah um and so that actually may be the the pivot point that is going to have him consider moving to uh more longer living Yeah. yeah something like that place you know, when we think about meeting people at the highest level of contribution, the three stages really helps us out because we don't ask people to contribute more than they're able to. If you've just shown up the Sunday suppers, I remember my first time, just tell me what to do. Sweep, do this, do that. I don't know. I, I don't even know if this is for me or not. I was casually curious. I was not there for meaningful discovery, meaning I wasn't coming back like I'm getting something out of this. I, I, I didn't even know what it was about. And I think sometimes, you know, when we talk about helping in volunteers either we're working with volunteers and we would love them to be second or third stage right away and they're not Mm -hmm. right even if they're third stage working with animals working with homeless they're going to start that journey out and figure it out and all that kind of thing also on the side of people showing up for the first time i think we have to be comfortable with what our highest level contribution is and not worry that we should be doing more or doing it differently. Be open to it. Like right. you mentioned um, earlier on when we were talking about my dad and his highest level of contribution was not to sit down with guests. I don't right. think he ever sat and ate a meal. No. Oh, no, no. That's inefficient. No. Couldn't, <laughs> couldn't get there for his mindset. But he organized the hell out yeah. of all of the storage materials. It was a, it was a, it was catastrophe and he brought it all out and organized it and we never didn't have supplies. Well, he, that, I mean, in order for the Sunday suppers to run, if Daryl didn't go to Costco on Wednesdays, right. there would be no Sunday supper. They, there, that's it, what right, happened. So yeah. He saw the gaps, saw yep. the places where he could contribute and did it quietly, effectively, efficiently. And I think uh, in similar ways found folks like Marguerite who yes. were similarly minded. Yes. So 
to, to do supplies, to get it set up. I can, I can, if I close my eyes, I can still see him crawling under the stage and pulling yeah. out tables and pulling out chairs, yeah. just weekend, like never getting tired of that mundane task that if you asked me to do that, I would feel like community service yeah. to me, that would feel like a punitive way of asking me to come serve you're going to set up all these tables. You're going to set up 200 chairs and then next week you're going to do it all over again. And he actually did it with a smile ish, smile. -ish. Uh, Daryl smile. Yeah. Daryl yeah, smile. Yeah. 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 <laughs> A I grin, a grin, a grin. Yeah, he he did really enjoy it, and I the testament in my mind to him doing it the right because you could look at it and say, hey, that's pretty transactional. He's just coming to do stuff. He's not getting to know people. The number of people who showed up at his funeral in mm. 2017 from the suppers, there weren't thousands, but there was a proper showing of yeah. individuals who I think a lot of other people would just wonder, why are they here? And they right. were here because who they saw Daryl was to them. And so he did find ways to have those relationships and connections. But I think it was important for us to not say, oh, he should be operating at this level. We didn't do that. We just created open space where he could find his niche. Yeah. And then his part was to be okay with that niche and, mm -hmm. and to continue to remember it's about the people. It's not about plastic forks. And, and he never got that confused, but he expressed his love for those people mm -hmm. through the Costco trips. And that's okay. That was good. Cause yeah. he knew, he knew their names and they knew his name. Not to, not to discount at all. I mean, I think if we're being completely honest, he, he was heavily subsidizing yeah. uh, the dream. That's true. Right. So he was yeah. also involved in the back end uh, because as we were gallivanting around in, in in a nice new van trying to fill it up with, you know, muffins and bread, whatever. He, yeah. He's putting the gas in. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, he made it. Yeah, that's true. Made a significant contribution. But I think for those of us organizing space for people to meet other parts of a community to do it through, quote unquote, volunteering or giving. And now I'm using air quotes. As well as those of us getting involved to not feel like we have to be at stage two or three or have to be a certain version of ourselves, but just go and explore not only your community, but yourself. Yeah. Like what is, what is your highest level contribution? Who can you be for your community? Oh, I think that's massively important and to slow down the judgment, right? Yeah. So you don't know what's going on for, yeah. for another person. And so make this about personal journey. It, it's sort of the work that you're doing collectively. The task is is collective, but the work is is internal. And uh, the work is internal. Yeah, you know whether it's trying to figure out Marguerite or figure out Daryl or figure out it, it doesn't really matter uh, no. as long as you're moving and it's disorienting you. That's don't right. Don't worry about someone else's disorienting dilemma. Yes, exactly. Create space in it. Don't be judging yourself. You might be freed up on the judgment of others around you. This was fun. Although I'm thinking, I'm going to email you after and say, hey, Jake, we should talk about this next and whatnot. We only have a couple episodes <laughs> left this season. Our last one is December 16th. So we've got some sort of things to figure out. And we're very excited about next season. So we'll give you more info as we oh, get Oh, good closer teaser. A third yeah. season. Third season. All right. Well, if folks want to send us ideas, get us on Twitter, wherever yeah. you download this uh, podcast from, uh, follow the links there. Give us some ideas. What haven't we talked about? Similarly, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? <laughs> what or did open we get to that wrong? feedback. All right. Sounds great. See you next time, Jake. Okay. See you. This has been a Podstarter production. production.